Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you've been blessed by the service. If you don't have a church home, we would love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. And you can connect with us by going to cccfamily.com. Let us know that you've been uh, joining us for church. You can fill out the online connect card there. Give us your information. We can help you take the next step. If you have a prayer concern that you'd like our prayer teams to pray about, you can do that as well. If you'd like to support the ministry here at Christ Community Church, you can also give online at cccfamily.com and we appreciate all that God is doing in and through each and every one of you. Hey, thanks again for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you again soon, either online or in person. God bless you. The Good Shepherd, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, I got the guys singing, Mike. I think, Brad, can I sing a little? Oh, I'm just kidding. Hey, I want to welcome you online as well. I want to introduce our special guest speaker for today, Jeremy Procassini. If we can give him a warm CCC welcome. You can give him a little what's up from home, too. So Jeremy works for an organization, him and his wife, Terry, out in Southern California called Novo. And so he's going to continue on through our I Am series here today. Uh, but I know he's got a great word to share. So let's open our hearts to what the Holy Spirit has for us today. Do you need to be pruned? Seems like a random or an odd question, right? You know, I, I thought the same thing about five or six years ago when I was uh, being recruited by Novo, and I'd had a few conversations, and I got a phone call from a guy named Norris Williams. See, Norris was responsible for spearheading some movements of the gospel in some difficult parts of the world. I had heard him speak, and I was really looking forward to what he had to share with me. You know, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce, so to speak, to this type of ministry impact? So I was a little bit surprised when I got the phone call, and the first thing he asked me was, are you willing to be pruned? Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to remove everything out of your life that would be a hindrance to the spread of the gospel? You see, because Norris is a cherry farmer, up in eastern Washington. And he told me this story about when he, how when he first bought his property, he had about 300 cherry trees. And he had learned to prune a little bit here and there, but he wasn't getting the yield that he was looking for. He wasn't getting the harvest. So he went into town and he found a guy, a Hispanic gentleman, that was known for, for being able to prune really well. And he invited him over to his property. So Norris got out his loppers, you know that tool, kind of long, two long sticks with almost like scissor looking things on the end. Oh yeah, I can see you in the front here. Yeah, you know the loppers, right? Yeah. So Norris gets his loppers out, he's taking off a little here, a little there, and the guy runs over to him. And Norris is a big dude, okay, really big, like a football player. Actually was a football player, but didn't want me to mention that, so don't tell anyone. And so this guy runs up to him, he pulls the loppers away, and he just starts hacking away branches off of Norris's trees. And Norris is like, whoa, wait a second. You're going to kill the trees. And the guy looks up at him and he says, if you don't hurt the trees, no fruit. So Norris said, okay. He let it go. And at the end of the season, it was the best harvest that they had ever seen on that property. So that's a little bit of a framework for what we're going to look at today in John 15, verses 1 to 5. So if you would please stand 
We'll read this together. Now, I'm going to add this little accessory because I'm going to open up my Bible and read from it. I turned 40 and can't really read anything without these things. So, I'm sure a lot of you feel my pain. John 15, verse 1, let's start. Read it out loud and proud, as Matt would say. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. See, this passage picks up right after the account in John 14, where Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. It's where he washed feet. It's where he promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come. And scholars are in a little bit of a debate, which scholars tend to do, as to whether he was still in the upper room or whether he was moving on to his next location. That's not really super important for what we're going to talk about today. But what we do know is Jesus would always take an opportunity to teach the people he was around. It seems like a random example in our culture a vine and branches, but it wasn't random to the people that Jesus was speaking with. You see, the disciples were from an area of the world where it was an agrarian culture or a farming community. So growing plants like grapevines and other other trees and things like that for fruit, this was familiar to these guys. So it wasn't as much a creative display or an example as it was a practical one. See, Norris is a cherry farmer, as I said, and he lives in a farming community. So when he uses examples like this, it really connects with the people in his community. When he talks about pruning and vines and things like that, people understand it. You get the main points of the passage lived out right in front of you, or in Jesus' case, the teaching. We still use this in missions today, we use a little, a little buzzword called contextualization where you take practical examples to teach biblical truth. Now, we don't change the Bible and the essence of the scripture, but we use different techniques to tell stories so that people can understand it better. So they understood by the example Jesus used, but these were also Hebrew men. So they understood the Old Testament and they understood the teachings of the prophets. They understood the passage in Isaiah, verse 27, verse, and I'm going to read it. It's verse 2 to 3 and 6. It says, In that day a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it. Lest anyone punish it, I keep it night and day. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Sound familiar? Put off shoots and fill the world with fruit. You see, during the Old Testament time, it was the people of Israel that God used to carry out his mission. And now in the New Testament, it was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is playing a new role. So I'm going to just go through this text verse by verse, unpack it a little bit, and use some examples so we can gain a little bit of a better understanding. Before I do that, I'm going to pray. So if you would bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to be here in this church. I thank you for Christ Community Church and all of the ministry and the different things that you're doing through this community. Our hearts all across our country and beyond are with the people of Ukraine. They're with the people of Ukraine and they're with the many workers who are there serving. Whether it's putting out beds or sharing meals, 
serving felt needs of all kinds. Lord, we ask that your strength would be on them. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be evident in them. Lord, would you uplift them and give them the courage and all the things that they need to reach the many needs around them, Lord. Let them not be afraid of all the chaos, but focus on you. We don't take for granted that we're here safely in this building to worship you. Thank you for this opportunity to hear from you. Lord, and allow me to step aside so that your will can be done this morning. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. John 15, verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And this is actually Jesus' seventh I am statement. See, I've, I've been following along a little bit, and I watched the sermon a couple weeks ago, so I know that Matt laid out all of them for you. So let's just go through them one by one today, just so we can get them into our minds a little bit. So if you could read out loud with me, starting with the first one. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, from our passage this morning, I am the true vine. So the I am statements that Jesus is sharing are directly connected to an encounter Moses had in Exodus chapter 3. Now, how many of you have favorite books of the Bible? Hopefully everybody, right? Maybe a few of you. See, I have two. I have an Old Testament book and a New Testament book. Exodus is my book in the Old Testament, okay? Exodus and Acts. I would would encourage you this morning, if you don't have a book or a story or a thing you connect with deeply, to pray about that. And if something catches you, focus on it for a little bit. There's probably a lot of teaching there that you can learn from. So Moses, he has his encounter with God in the burning bush, and then he has this little bit, he has a little bit of an identity crisis, right? God encounters him, he says, I'm going to use you to deliver my people, Israel. And Moses says, I, I can barely speak, you can't really be talking to me, and even if I do go and share with Pharaoh what you've given me to share, And then I go and I share with the people of Israel, who am I going to tell them has sent me? And God says this to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say this to the people of Israel, that I am has sent you. So in using this language, Jesus is once again affirming to the disciples that he is God. And then Jesus describes himself as the vine, And his father is the vine dresser. You see, they play two distinct roles. Some more modern translations, which are actually easier for me to understand, it goes further to say the grapevine and the gardener. You don't really see a whole lot of vine dresser type language out there, but gardener makes sense to a lot of us. They seem more functional, and it still brings out the main points of the scripture. So anybody here have grapevines in their backyard? My parents do, of course. I didn't grow up on a farm, so I don't know as much about it as they do now that they've started one. But my parents got one back there. So do we have any Italians, Greeks, Portuguese? This is part of the culture, right? Vine growing. Maybe your grandparents had one. Yeah. So Jesus is using some language here, but we we want to find out what it means. In order to do that, we need to understand a little bit about growing grapes. Now, I didn't have time to go into a whole lot of detail and all of the science behind growing grapes, but i got to tell you, I was tempted. Here's the little bit that I picked up that I think is important. The grapevine has two functions, main functions, to deliver minerals and nutrients to the fruit and to support its weight. So it holds the fruit up, provides everything that it needs to live. And the vine dresser or the gardener cares for the vine, waters it, makes sure there's plenty of sunlight, and cuts away any excess branches 
that get in the way from the ones that are going to produce fruit. But even the ones that are, going, are producing fruit, he cuts them back. Both work together so that healthy fruit, abundant fruit, can be produced. But we want to ask ourselves, what role do we play in that? See, because there's a third role. We're the branches. As we read on, Jesus provides a little bit more detail. In verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may be bear more fruit. See, I had to do that little deal. In reading this, we realize not all branches produce the same fruit. And some don't produce any fruit at all. Some will produce fruit and others won't. That's what it says. The branches that will never bear fruit have to be removed so that the healthy ones can survive and thrive. Jesus actually says every branch that does not bear fruit will be cut from the vine. But there's, also, there's those that are healthy that need to be pruned. Remember, if you don't hurt the tree, no fruits. So we have to ask ourselves an obvious question. How does God prune people? What does this pruning actually look like? Theologian Alistair McGrath says it like this. Just as a father disciplines only those whom he loves, so the father only prunes those branches that he expects to bear fruit. Christians must learn to see suffering, difficulty, or adversity as a form of God's pruning, by which he will make them better Christians and more effective witnesses in the world. Let's look at that last part one more time. We must learn as Christians to see suffering, difficulty, or adversity as a form of God's pruning, so that we can become what? Better Christians, and what? More effective witnesses in the world. I found this true in my life, but it hasn't always been easy. Maybe some of you have had the same experiences. See, back in September, my wife, Terry, she's sitting right over here on the left, she said, I have a little bit of a pain in my abdomen, and it won't go away. And we were like, oh, you know, it could be a number of things at that point. A little stomach bug, maybe a stomach version of COVID or something like that. We didn't really understand a whole lot about what was going on. But she woke up in just agonizing pain one morning and said, I think I need to go in. This is, just keeps getting worse. So I take her in, and this was in the middle of one of those COVID spikes. So we got her into a wheelchair, wheel her up, and they say, oh, we'll take it from here. It's like, what do you mean you'll take it from here? You, you can't come in because of COVID. And I was brought back. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've heard stories about this from some of the old timers back when I worked in the heating and air conditioning industry. They say, yeah, when, I, when our wives were pregnant and they were going to have babies, we'd just, we'd just bring them in there and say, okay, give us a call when this is all done. And they'd get a phone call at work, and they'd go back and pick them up. I'm like, we've gone I've gone back like 40 or 50 years here. People have done this before, but it's uncomfortable. I don't like it. This is beyond my control. And so now we're on text messages and phone calls. We find out that it's an appendix that is ruptured. And we were looking at six weeks of recovery. Now, Thierry was obviously very uncomfortable and struggling. And to be completely honest with you, I was struggling too. The things I was struggling with were my lack of control, my need to produce things or to strive because she needed somebody to take care of her and I needed to be that person. And I felt inadequate. I felt like these generous people in churches that supported our ministry, I didn't know how how they would react. I was thinking about all this stuff. I had to struggle through. What it was, was the Lord was pruning me. So, Terry got through it. Fast forward a couple of 
months, and she gets a staph infection. This was just actually a couple of weeks ago. But here's what I could tell you. It wasn't the easiest thing she's been through, and wasn't the, definitely wasn't, well, it wasn't easy for me either, but I could tell that I had learned a couple things through our previous experience. Because there was one night I remember waking up, and she was in some pain and, say, and rolling over and saying, it's going, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. God is going to provide. I wasn't able to say those things the first time around, but this time I knew because I had had those doubts and those things. The Holy Spirit had pruned those things out of my life. And you probably have similar experiences. He says, John writes in one of my favorite verses in Revelation, those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. This has been my experience in those times and in prior ones. As parents, don't we correct our children because we love them? Unfortunately, in similar circumstances, some of us turn away when the heat cranks up around us. We turn away from God. And if we hear things we don't like or we don't want to change, we're tempted to walk away. But I want to encourage you this morning. If you feel that, if you feel tension around you, if you feel that God may be saying things to you that you don't understand or that are challenging to you, I want to encourage you to lean into those things. Talk to him about it. He can handle it. Let him do his work. Let him cut some things out. Don't be afraid to wrestle with it. Moving forward in John 15, verse 3. It says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now, when I was preparing for this message, I was in the library at our church, Fullerton Free, in North Orange County, California. And a friend of mine walked up, and he says, Hey, what are you doing? I said, Oh, I'm putting together this message that I'm going to preach at the end of the month. He said, What, what uh, verses are you going over? I said, John 15, verse 1 to 5. And he said, Oh, interesting. When you're, when you're done studying, can you tell me what verse 3 is all about? Like, how does that fit? Because it seems like a little bit of a random verse in the middle. But what was great was it caused me to think about it a little bit. Sort of place myself in the passage. You know, Jesus is talking about some challenging stuff in this passage. And I could picture myself as one of the disciples going, so where do I stand in all of this? Right? Which branch am I? The, the doubt. These are, no, these are normal men, right? The doubt creeps in. And then Jesus, I'm, as you can see in the scriptures and the stories you see about him, he's sensitive to this stuff. So he tells them, you've already been made clean because of the words that I've spoken to you. I could just picture myself going, Whew. right? Okay, we're on good terms. Maybe you wandered in here today and you're wondering where you stand with God this morning. It's okay to be real and honest about that. For those of you that have been on the journey with him, the word has already washed over you and made you clean. Cling to that. So if you're feeling tense about it, just kind of let it go. Let him speak to you. In John 15, verse 4, the next verse, and it says, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. In my opinion, our whole existence as followers of Jesus boils down to this. Do we abide in Christ? This is something we talk about regularly on my team with Novo. As people of action, people that serve, people that like, we like to be in the mix, doing creative ministry things, it's tempting to do that stuff in our own strength and with our own knowledge. 
So we ask ourselves this question of accountability. Are we being, meaning are we being and connected to Jesus Christ the vine and doing? Or are we just doing without being? We found that our effectiveness in ministry is directly connected to our relationship with Jesus. A vibrant relationship with Jesus is one of the main keys to effective ministry. That's been our experience. Doing without being only goes so far. We found in a lot of cases it actually goes nowhere. And learning to abide in Christ, it's the most important thing. Merriam-Webster Dictionary says, defines it this way. Abide means to remain in. Real simple. Abide in the vine means to remain in the vine. So we must remain in Christ. In Christ, And what does he promise to do if we remain in him? He promises to remain in us. With us and in us. And it's not that we can do little. Jesus is specific here. If we're not connected to him in this way, we can actually do nothing. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't go out and serve and do practical things, right? Get out there and meet people where they are. But it does mean that we are not capable of transforming a life. We cannot transform a life. We cannot transform our own life, and we cannot transform the lives of others. Only Jesus can do that through his Holy Spirit. I know this is difficult, but the longer we walk with Christ, we realize how true this is. Let's continue on in John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Jesus is slightly repetitive here. And here's a little Bible study tip that I've picked up over the years. If Jesus gets repetitive, what does that mean? Pay attention. It's like when he says, therefore, or listen, or in some translations, listen up. I want you to get this. He reminds his disciples back then and to us today that he is the vine and we are the branches. And he emphasizes our need to abide in him. But he adds one more thing. If we will abide in him, then we will bear much fruit. Is it a little fruit? Some fruit? Much, he says, much fruit. So you might be asking yourself, what type of fruit is Jesus talking about? We keep using this word fruit. What does that mean? So there are a couple different trains of thought on this. Scholars differ. That's not a big surprise. That happens a lot out there. There are two, two different sides of this, and I think both of them are right. When it comes to this question, some believe that he is pointing to the fruits of the Spirit that Paul lists in Galatians chapter 5, and I've put those up in front of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we abide in Christ, the Holy Spirit works within us. These attributes become the fruit of our lives. And they're actually the attributes that you see lived out in Jesus' life when he did his ministry on earth. See, it's, an in, it's more of an internal thing. It's an internal work. But it's not necessarily evidenced in the way that we live and the way that we serve. That's one side of this argument. The other side attributes it directly to fruitfulness in ministry, in obedience to the calls of Jesus and the commands of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in Matthew 28. Though that hasn't come about yet, 
He still sent people out to minister in their home, hometown. He said, love your neighbors. That fruit of obedience is what is emphasized by this other group. I'm here to tell you today that I believe it's both. Because doesn't it make sense that the same God who produces the fruit of the Spirit within us would use us, would use this fruit to reach others around us? Let me say it a different way. Isn't it just like God to produce something in us so he can reach people through us? See, Jesus spent years cultivating this fruit in the lives of his disciples. Then he unleashed them on the world. And our lives have been transformed today because of that work that Jesus did with them and that they spread throughout the world. Why would we have it any other way? So it's both. It's a transformation internal and it's a living out external. The disagreements baffle me a little bit, but hey, it's all right. Both bring something. So there's this other gentleman I can't say, I can't use names, and I can't use exact places where this is going on because of security reasons. So I'm going to be vague, but I at least wanted you to know why I'm being so vague. And this gentleman's the guy on the ground that was, I, that was chosen by Norris Williams, who leads these groups of new believers in predominantly Muslim countries. For years, we have seen thousands of Muslim background people become followers of Jesus through the work of this man's ministry. And so I got the chance to sit down with him to ask him once again, what have you learned? What are some things that we can put into practice here in the States? And once again, I was surprised by his answer. He says, it, it's very simple. Be Jesus to others. See, without the internal work, which is evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we'll not see new followers of Jesus. He says, if people don't experience Jesus when they're with you, and they don't experience Jesus in the work that you're doing in their communities, then they will not be attracted to him. His Holy Spirit and its work in you, they'll be drawn to it. His Holy Spirit will draw them, but he'll use you too. We need to put Jesus on display for all today. And this only happens if we remain connected in a vibrant relationship with him. It's true in our lives. It's true in our churches. And it's true in our communities. If we live lives that reflect Jesus and we live out in obedience to him, the people that live that are in relationship with us, they'll notice that. They'll notice the same in this church. The Holy Spirit is at work in this church, you can tell. And he's at work through all of you. And when people come in from the outside, they can sense that. They can see it. They can feel it. They experience it. May this church always be that way. But it's the same thing in our communities where pockets of Jesus followers are in these communities and they're living life in obedience to what Jesus has taught by the power of his Holy Spirit. We've seen around the world that these communities could be transformed and see new, to see new followers of Jesus. That's what we're talking about here today. That's what happens when we abide in the vine in our lives, churches, and communities. Now, in closing, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I just have two questions for you today. The first one is, are you connected to the vine? Do you know Jesus? Do you understand about his life on earth, his death, and his resurrection? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Do you desire to be renewed and reborn and transformed by his love. If you've come in here today and that's something that you're seeking, I'm going to ask you to be sensitive to that. 
Not only that, but I'll ask you to take one step further and come up and speak to one of us after the service. There's a little card in the seat backs that you could fill out so that you could be put in a, what they call a discovery group. So you could get into the Word of God. So key to, be, to learning how to become a follower of Jesus and to be renewed and strengthened by His Holy Spirit. And get a mentor. Find somebody that's been walking with Jesus so that they can walk with you and help develop you. And there's one more thing that I'd like all of us to do. My question is, what needs to be pruned? And here's what I'm asking you to do. You know, the Holy Spirit, he's the nutrients and the minerals that flow through the vine, who is Jesus Christ. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit now in this moment to come and to minister to all of us, to speak to us. So if we could just take a couple moments now before you stand up to worship, even if the band is playing, just Stay in your seats for a minute and reflect. Ask the Lord, what is it in my life that needs to be pruned? And when you're clear about what that is, if you just stand up with your hands like this and then just open them and release it to the Lord. This is a simple thing that I've found is very effective in my life. Those things that I hung on to when Terry was struggling, I learned to just open up my hands and that that action right there is so helpful to release it to, to God. So, Lord Jesus, we know your Holy Spirit is with us. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us now through that very Holy Spirit to give us those things that we need to grow, those minerals, as it says, that he delivers to the vine. Would you deliver to us the things that we need to have pruned away? Lord, and we know you are faithful to remove those things from us when we offer them to you. So in these moments, as you, only you know how, would you minister to each and every person in this place, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the word of God. Uh, we'd encourage you to also uh, get into the word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you.